in their right mind would go into someone's private property and steal your trailer, just hook up and pull away. A Red River Valley family is warning you about thieves, thieves who stole their camper from their yard. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Authorities are asking for you to keep an eye out for this stolen camper. It went missing from a farm in Pekin, North Dakota, over the weekend. The family remains hopeful, but doubts they will ever see it again. Valley News Team's crime and safety reporter Nicole Johnson has their advice for others. I think it's a warning to other people. It's a summer ritual for Sheila McGee. Her kids and her husband okay. stay in this camper every weekend during the summer. Brian went out to the farm to mow the lawn, just check on the camper, and he calls and said, camper's gone. And I was in complete shock. I thought he was kind of kidding at first. They filed a police report, posted pictures on Facebook, but think their camper worth over $5,000 is gone. They learned a lesson the hard way. You will get a lock for the hitch and for the wheels so that you can't move it. Unfortunately, police say camper thieves are common. During a recent ride along I did with Fargo police, we drove past multiple trailers left out in the open. It's relatively simple for someone just to back in, hook it up, and they're gone within a matter of seconds. Police say when they pull someone over, they always check the registration of the vehicle, but they don't always check the registration of what's hooked up to the back. So if someone does get away with your trailer, police might not know that it's stolen. Keep an eye open and know that there's people around that will do that. To protect yourself from getting your trailer or RV stolen, you can tell your neighbors to watch out for you when you're going somewhere. You can put up yard lights or another useful tool is putting up a trail cam so you can figure out who it is trying to steal your stuff. Don't take anything for granted. Assume that anything can happen. Nicole Johnson, Valley News Live. The Nelson County Sheriff's Department is looking for whoever stole the RV. If you have any information or you spot this license plate, you're asked to call the department. That is Minnesota license plate RT60255. The telephone number for tips is 701-247-2474. A local mom wants the community to be more aware of autism and the safety issues that go along with it. Barbara Milham Field has a nine-year-old son with autism. She says Logan, along with many others, wander from home and don't respond to help during an emergency the way you might expect. Milham Field says police, paramedics, firefighters, teachers and neighbors should be more familiar with developmental disabilities. As a parent with a child that has special needs, we have to kind of look to our, para, our paras, uh, paraprofessionals in school, as well as our teachers, um, to kind of look after the needs of our children when we're not there. And a lot of them don't have the training that's needed. And I found that very early in Logan's uh, schooling. Milham Field is inviting the whole community to a local educational opportunity over the next couple of days to learn more. Now, the first is tomorrow night. The event is free. It's going to be at the Fargo Public Safety Building from 4 in the afternoon until 6 p.m. A 34-year-old man faces charges after police say he hit 135 miles an hour during a high-speed chase and for having open cans of beer surrounding his 2-year-old daughter in the back seat. Dustin Bruce Martin is charged with fleeing police, first-degree DWI, and child neglect. Over the weekend, Glendon police say Martin was seen speeding in a silver 2009 Pontiac G8 with a North Dakota license plate. When officers initiated a traffic stop, they say Martin sped away, hitting speeds of 110 miles an hour on Highway 10, then a speed of 135 on Highway 9, and then back down to 80 miles an hour on a gravel road. They say he eventually stopped at a home near Holly, Minnesota. Hillary Clinton has reached the magic number of delegates needed to become the Democratic Party's presumptive presidential nominee. Clinton went over the top tonight with a combination of pledged and superdelegate votes, bringing the tally to 2,383 in her race against Senator Bernie Sanders. Clinton becomes the first woman to ever win the nomination. The Grand Forks Library Board will give its recommendation to the City Council on where they think a new library should be built in a few weeks. The new library would replace the current one that's 45 years old. Valley News Team's Cornelius Hawker took a tour of the building with the maintenance supervisor who says renovating the current space just won't cut it. This is how the ventilation system vents around the library. 
So there is no control on, on uh, how much or how, how much air or the temperature of the air. Grand Forks Library's maintenance supervisor Wayne Springer says his work days are spent maintaining equipment and decor that weren't even made in this century. The carpet here, the brown, is original from 72. Good majority of our equipment is still original equipment. Um, it needs updating. Um, our electrical system is really outdated because it was never brought into to have computers, uh, anything on, on technology wise. After 45 years, Springer says the building, which met all code requirements at the time it was built, is now not up to code. It's even not in compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. They're too high and too narrow. Um, because of the way our pillars are, we, we've, they, they, they set up the shelving. Um, some shelving areas are too narrow for a wheelchair right now. Corey Mock is on the library board. He says renovating the current building would cost between eight and nine million dollars. If they expanded on the current building, it would cost around 17 million, and a new building would cost between 22 and 23 million. When you look at how much you're investing in a in a 40 plus year old building versus building new, um, the recommendations of every professional has said to look at a new location, make that recommendation, and put the put, put that information before the city to make a, a the right decision for Grand Forks. Grand Forks Mayor Michael Brown says he supports whatever the library board decides on. We've had um, six sets of consultants, uh, PhDs in engineering and engineers who have said the remodel is not as good as rebuilding. And I have great respect also for education and training. And I think if that's what the experts suggest, we can move ahead as a community with great confidence. In Grand Forks, Cornelius Hawker, Valley News Live. Now, after the board makes its recommendation to the city council, they'll decide if it's a project worth funding and then how to fund. County me council members say it's probably going to go up for a vote. The deadline for a tax cut bill is hours away for Minnesota Governor Mark Dayton to sign or essentially veto it. Dayton, uh, Dayton was the, says the tax bill has a drafting error and that the error could be fixed in a special session. Dayton wants Republican leaders to agree to his conditions before calling that special session. House Republicans are hoping Minnesotans bring a change of heart for the governor, convincing him on the need for tax relief. Supporters say a tax bill that would bring $800 million in tax relief over three years, a measure lawmakers passed with 89 percent bipartisan support. The Veterans Affairs is wading into the issue of gender-altering surgeries. Current VA policy is that they're banned, and there's no medical reason to do it. Just days ago, the agency is accepting public comment to change that, saying new advances in medical care and new research show at times these types of procedures could be medically necessary. However, some are not ready to have their tax dollars pay for the surgery. They've got a lot of problems the way it is. They need to take care of the guys that have been hurt during uh, combat or doing their service, not just for cosmetic stuff. <laughs> Full language of what the VA is proposing is on our website, valleynewslive.com. 8th Street in Moorhead is the busiest street in town, and with a construction project going on, it'll be even busier. The second phase of interchange reconstruction is underway. Now, the project goes from 24th Avenue to 30th Avenue South. The bridge crossing over the interstate is closed. Valley News Team's Yovana Simich has driver reaction and some tips on making your commute easier. The first pace of traffic isn't good for drivers along this stretch in Moorhead. Really bad, <laughs> especially on 8th Street. Something that would take one minute took about 25, 30. You know, and there was people way back behind me, so I mean, it just gets more frustrating. Chris Altman, who is from California and knows what congested traffic is all about, says the traffic he's seen on 8th Street has been hectic. Probably nothing worse if you're trying to get off or you're going to go somewhere, or you're late to pick up your kids, and boom, now you're stuck on something you drive every day. Whenever you make major changes to the traffic control like we did today, there are backups and there's extra congestion. Jeremiah Morkey with Minnesota DOT says since this was the first day of the project, traffic was a big problem. Traffic will adjust and make changes or kind of self-adjust. Drivers will adjust their route, adjust their timing. So what you experience today may be different from what you experience tomorrow. MNDOT says with construction scheduled all summer, traffic will be an issue. So leave earlier and remove all driving distractions. Traffic can stop very suddenly and those distractions are more likely to cause a crash. And if you have a crash in a work zone with a single lane of traffic, you're going to back it up and make it even worse. In Moorhead, Yovana Simic, Valley News Live.
Here's some important advice. For a look at the best routes to take, we have a link to the project website on valleynewslive.com under the hot button. As of today, all residents and businesses in West Fargo are now receiving water from the city of Fargo's water treatment plant. The flushing process to remove all of the water from West Fargo's former source, the city's aquifers, is complete. West Fargo water customers will continue to receive utility bills from the city of West Fargo. To read up on previous stories we did on West Fargo water, head to valleynewslive.com and click on this story. Minnesota Governor Mark Dayton has declared that tomorrow, June 7th, will be Prince Day in Minnesota. Prince was born on June 7th, 1958 in Minneapolis. He passed away suddenly on April 21st of this year. The governor says that the proclamation is meant to celebrate Prince's life and many contributions, not only in the arts and culture, but also in his many acts of service.